Hi everyone, my name is Frank Noskesi and I am a high school physics teacher at John Jay High School in Cross River, New York. My presentation today has two parts. The first part explores some labs at home that I've done with students. And in the second half, I will show you uh, Desmos Activity Builder, which I found to be really, really helpful uh, teaching remotely and uh, in, in hybrid mode. So, labs at home. This is the tipping the box lab. I've done this lab with my AP Physics C mechanics students. And it's a really simple lab where they find the coefficient of friction between a box and a grippy surface. And all they need is a ruler. So what they would do is they would find a box and a grippy surface could be rubber, like a yoga mat, or maybe a bathroom carpet or something like that. And they put the box on top as tall as it can be. And they push on the box at the bottom and hopefully when they push forwards on the box near the bottom, the box will slide forward. And when they push at the top of the box, the box should tip over. And somewhere between the top of the box and the bottom of the box is a point where the box won't simply slide or simply tip. It'll be right on the verge of tipping versus sliding. When they find that point and they measure that height and the dimensions of the box, and they can use those measurements to figure out the coefficient of friction by applying some of the torques is equal to zero and some of the forces is equal to zero. And then they rotate the box 90 degrees and they repeat. And because the box should be a rectangular box, that uh, tipping point is gonna be at a different location on the box. And uh, they go through the calculations again and they get two different but hopefully similar values for the coefficient of friction between the box and the grippy surface. These are the boxes my AP physics students used when they did the lab at home this year. It's interesting to see the variety of boxes and surfaces that they used. Also, I was hoping that they would, you know, intrigue a family member as to what they were doing. Um, and again, they thought it was pretty cool. And I thought it was pretty cool that they could figure out the coefficient of friction just by taking some very simple measurements. No spring scales needed, no mass sets needed, just uh, a ruler and being able to tip over the box at the right spot. In this lab, students are tasked to find the Young's modulus of a marshmallow. And as you can see in the picture here, I'm actually carrying out the lab over Zoom for my students to record data at home. Uh, however, after the lab was over, I realized that this was a lab that they could probably do on their own at home as well. Um, although they don't have mass sets, they could use water to weigh down the marshmallow. So you could see here in the picture, there's two plastic cups uh, with the marshmallow in the first plastic cup and then resting on top of the marshmallow is the second plastic cup. And then in that second plastic cup are those uh, cylindrical metal masses. If the students were to do this at home, they would, instead of having the mass sets, they would fill the cup with water and then uh, knowing that a certain volume of water has a certain mass, you know, using uh, the density of water, then they could figure out you know, how much weight of water is bearing down on top of the marshmallow and use that to, fact, to figure out stress and strain for different amounts of water, graph stress versus strain, and the slope would be Young's modulus for the marshmallow. Uh, this is a fun lab and uh, again, uses very simple materials. And I think it could be adapted at home pretty easily using water instead of weights. This is a lab that I found from Kristen Newton who graciously shared it over Twitter. It's an introduction to friction lab. And it's not a quantitative lab where students will be taking mathematical data and graphing and looking for patterns. Rather, it's more of a qualitative introduction to the factors that affect the friction between two surfaces. And all the students need to do is get some kind of object to act as a sled that they'll pull and put masses in. 
the picture on the left shows one of my students who used a paper plate and a hair tie to pull it with. Uh, the one in the middle is a Tupperware container with a rubber band, and the one on the right is a shoebox top, also with a rubber band to pull. And then they're using water bottles, canned goods, other objects as masses to increase the normal force between the sled and the surface. So they test the, uh, the weight in the sled or the normal force. They test the type of surface that they're pulling it over. So they're pulling it over the smooth table, maybe try a carpet, maybe try grass outside or concrete and see the different effects of uh, the different variables on how hard they have to pull to get it to start to slide. And then follow up with this with a simulation, since again, we're teaching in a hybrid slash remote setting. So my students did not do a traditional physics lab on friction that they normally would have done with say force sensors and uh, friction sleds and carpet and wood and mass sets. So we used the physics aviary simulation, which does a really great job of kind of simulating what we would normally do in class. Um, but I didn't want them to just kind of jump into that black box simulation right away. And I really liked Kristen's idea of just that qualitative hands-on introduction for the lab. And again, since they're doing it at home, hopefully they can uh, ask a family member for help or at least spur a conversation with a family member as they're watching them do the lab. Oh, that looks really interesting. So um, it was a really cool activity. This next one isn't so much of a lab activity, but uh, something that Joe and I were discussing uh, before we decided to, to make our presentations. And uh, one of the things that I always share when I get a chance to is this little trick that I've used for students when they are learning their hand rolls. So if you've ever seen <laughs> a student, you know, that's when, they're, when it's test day, right? <laughs> and everybody's got their right hand or their left hand and they're making those funny little shapes like in this uh, in this little animation from uh, Mr. Sterling shared it on Twitter a few years ago. Makes me laugh, um, right? And that can kind of be a struggle. And a few years ago, I had a student who on the day of that hand rule test had his arm in a sling and there he is trying so hard to do the hand rolls with his hand in a sling. And I realized that there's gotta be a way to do this without having to kind of contort your hand. You know, is there an easier way to do it? And I had found these, I had found these hand erasers on Amazon and I had bought them. And then the following year I had given them to my students and you can, they're right hands and uh, there's the little thumb for the current, and then you've got the four fingers for the magnetic field, and then the palm is uh, the direction of the force, and it worked out really, really well. But with the pandemic, I haven't gotten to this yet, but with the pandemic, um, and most of my students are at home, I, I can't distribute these erasers for them anymore. And when I was discussing this with Joe, <laughs> he mentioned, we mentioned about um, Thanksgiving hand turkeys and we laughed. And then as we laughed, like, oh, that's so funny. We thought maybe that's actually a really good idea. So I ended up trying to make one, uh, traced my little hand turkey and that's a drinking straw that's taped to the back. And, you know, I tried my best to get my thumb at a right angle to the, to my fingers, but you know, they can draw on it, decorate it, label, which uh, piece, which part of the hand represents, you know, which vector and, uh, they can use it, you know, on the test. Cause I know you've seen probably, you know, there's some orientations where you have to really kind of contort your hand around. Um, and when the hand is on a stick like this, you don't really have to do those contortions. And it's a lot easier to align the fingers and the thumb and the palm in the directions that they should be. I know that kids can rotate the paper too, but a lot of times they don't do that. They keep the paper in place and they try to contort their hands. So hopefully uh, I'm going to try this this year with the, with the hand turkeys and maybe even have a little decoration competition or something like that uh, and see, 
see how it works. Um, it, it, this is a FET simulation. You've probably seen this. It's the uh, net force, force in motion basic simulation where you can add and subtract people and uh, you know get the cart to accelerate in either direction. It shows the sum of the forces and uh, uh, the speed of the cart at any given moment. Um, and the reason why I bring this one up is because I tried something this year where instead of saying, you know, put two people on the blue side, put two people on the red side, press go, what happens, what do you observe? I gave them uh, 10 statements. I gave them 10 statements and they had to determine whether the statements were true or false. So now they were just kind of let go with the simulation and they had to prove whether, or I shouldn't say prove, but they had to either support or refute those uh, 10 statements. And a lot of them are uh, related to misconceptions that students have about force and motion. And I did two different versions. So this version is, is it true or false? And when students are working at home on their own with the simulation and they're using the true or false one, they don't necessarily know whether it's true or not. And sometimes they might just find a scenario that supports the statement and they're like, okay, I found one that works and it's done rather than looking for scenarios that would refute the statement. So I made a section, made a second version here that's a show that. So they know the answer already because it says like, show that a person's location on the rope doesn't matter. And then if they can't figure out right away that that doesn't work, then at least they know what is supposed to happen. Um, and maybe they'll tinker around a little bit more with the simulation so that they can show each of the scenarios. And in terms of common misconceptions, you know, there's one that says, show, the last one in particular, show that when the sum of forces is zero, the cart can be moving. So they might struggle with, with that. Um, and I really like the simulation in general because you could take people on and off the cart while it's in motion. So you can get that balanced force case or you can make a cart slow down. It, it's not just like put everything on at the beginning and then, you know, go and then that's it. The fact that you can add and subtract people while it's moving is really, really helpful. And then uh, these are just the results from uh, my students' work. After the, after the lab, what we did was they worked on them individually. And then the next day in class, I put them into breakout rooms. And each group got a different uh, scenario, one of the 10. So I had 10 groups, and each, each group got a different scenario. And they were responsible for, you know, justifying the results. And most of them decided to include a screenshot or two, which I thought was really cool, something they can't necessarily do when they're doing a pen and paper lab. Um, so I had like a blank PowerPoint set up and each slide was a different statement. And then they went into breakout rooms. And then as groups, they edited that common, uh, the, the PowerPoint to, uh, with their evidence for the, for the lab. And then they presented, when we breakout rooms closed, they presented back to the class. So the next part's about Desmos Activity Builder. You may know Desmos as a graphing calculator website, uh, graphing data, graphing equations. It's really, really powerful in math, but they also have an activity builder, which is kind of like a shared PowerPoint where you can make slides that have questions on them and then students can answer them and you can do it asynchronously. So they answer them at home and then you can watch how they work through it individually. You can do it as a class discussion and work through it together. Um, I've used it as pre-lab, post-lab, practice work. Uh, it's really, really flexible. So I'm just gonna show you some really cool things that you can do. So here's an example of a student view of a slide. And this has, this is just like the first of 18 slides. You can see in the top right corner, it says one of 18. And there's, you can draw on stuff. So the first question is a drawing question. So there's a, there's a picture there and then they can draw on it. I asked them to draw the direction of the gravitational force on each person, draw the, throw out an arrow to show the direction. You can ask questions that have, uh, 
free response. So that's like question two. You can ask multiple choice questions. That's like question three. And it's really, really simple to set up a slideshow with questions like that. Because on the teacher side, this is the activity builder where you would build the activity. You can see across the top row in blue, those are the individual slides. Right now it's focused on the first slide. And then on the left column, those are all the things that you, it's a drag and drop interface. You just drag over an item from the left side to the center of the screen and uh, then you can edit it. So you can add notes or text boxes, a text input box where a student would type in their answer, multiple choice, more, multiple select the check boxes. You can do ordered lists, graph sketch. You can add pictures, photos, video, tables. Um, really, really powerful. And then when students work through the activity, this is the, when students work through the activity, this is the teacher dashboard. So uh, you can see that I have multiple students. I can see all their drawings for the, uh, for the gravity question. I can see their answers for the typed question. And if I was able to scroll down, you would see the, the, like a little poll with bars showing how many students selected each of the multiple choice question options. At the top row in blue, where you see the, the slides, you can control whether the students uh, can work through all the slides at once, or you can focus them to only be able to work through a range of slides, or focus on one slide at a time so you can step through as a class one slide at a time and they can't go ahead or behind. Um, so depending on the type of activity, it's really helpful to have those options. And the, the slides in orange are the slides right now that the students are restricted to when I took this snapshot. So they can only work up to slide 10. There were not allowed to go up to slide 11 or 12 because we hadn't gotten there yet. I wanted to work, I, I wanted them to work through in little chunks, discuss, okay, then go to the next set of slides, come back, discuss. So here's just some examples of it in action. Uh, uh, position time and velocity time graphs ask the students to, to draw what they think the graph should look like. And you can, you can see all of the student responses at once if you want in this overlay mode. So that was really helpful. Like I said, you can add pictures there and you can make them annotate pictures. So here's a scenario where they were asked to identify in the pictures places of compression, stretch, and shear. And uh, the photos were provided by Kristen Newton and Kelly O'Shea, who made uh, interaction station labs on Desmos. And I stole little bits and pieces from, from them, from, from my students. I've used it as a post lab activity. So going back to that FET simulation with the carts and the red and blue people. Uh, so what did you get out of the activity? Okay, well, here's a Desmos kind of a check for understanding. So there's multiple choice and there's check all that apply. And I wanted to see what they remembered and what they learned from the, from the lab. And then, you know, this is the teacher screen where I can see, um, you know, which students picked which answer, which uh, a little bar graph showing approximately, you know, relatively how many students for each one and whether they picked the right answer or not, if I decided to include a right answer for the question. And you might be noticing the names are actually famous scientists and mathematicians. You have the option of anonymizing names in Desmos. So that way, if you wanted to share the results with a class, kind of like a peer instruction thing where you might poll the students, they answer the question, and then you show them the results of the poll. They don't necessarily see each other's names. They see these anonymized names, which is, which is really helpful. Uh, this is another case where I was using it for a bridging analogy activity where we're talking about, uh, you know, does a table push up on a book? And I had my demo set up and I was broadcasting those over the laptop and the power and the iPad. And then uh, we were kind of working through those one at a time. And I was kind of polling students for each little part of the uh, bridging analogy from the misconceptions in mechanics book. 
And you can also have video embedded in your Desmo slides. This is uh, some of the slides that I had done for a friction activity that we had done um, after they had explored the friction in that friction at home hands-on lab, but before they got to the, um, the simulation in the physics aviary. So kind of a bridge because they couldn't explore surface area or speed at home. And I have, you can see in the videos that I have uh, spring scales for them to compare the readings for, for different, uh, different scenarios. Thanks for watching my presentation. Again, my name is Frank Noskazy. I teach at John Jay High School in Cross River, New York. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at F Noskazy. And I have a collection of the Desmos activities. If you're interested in them, you can find them at that web address bit.ly slash Desmos. Thanks. Have a great rest of your conference.